Good evening, and thank you for joining our virtual community lecture brought to you by Providence. Our focus this evening is back and neck pain. I am Tom Burton, Executive Director of Orthopedic Sports Medicine, the Spine Clinical Institutes for Providence. And our guest speakers this evening are back and neck experts, Dr. Avinash Ramchandani and Dr. Remy Ajaboye. Before we get started, however, I want to let everyone know that this is going to be about an hour long presentation, and we will have plenty of time for questions at the end. The information will be shared in the chat, um, but please use the Q&A box to type in any questions you may have, and we will do our best to get to each question at the end of the presentation. Please note that we are not able to answer personal medical questions, but certainly can answer general back and neck pain related questions. If we're unable to answer your question, please feel free to email it to uh, callecture at providence.org. Let me spell that, C-A-L-E-C-T-U-R-E-S at providence, P-R-O-V-I-D-E-N-C-E dot org. And we'll get it back to you at our earliest, at our earliest opportunity. Now, Providence has 17 hospitals across California to care for all your medical needs, especially when it comes to finding lasting relief for back and neck pain. By bringing together expert physicians and experienced nurses, Providence provides complete care to help you alleviate back and neck pain symptoms. In this informative session, we'll teach you the common causes, signs, and symptoms of back and neck pain. We'll also share prevention strategies and treatment options from the latest advancements to help you achieve long-lasting relief. Lastly, we want our attendees to know that the information provided during this program is for educational purposes only. You should only consult your health should always, pardon me, you should always consult your healthcare provider if you have any questions regarding medical condition or treatment. <clears throat> now, it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Avinash Ramchandani. Dr. Ed Ramchandani is, native, is a native Bay Area resident who is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation and pain management. He was raised in the East Bay and completed his bachelor's degree at UC Berkeley medical school at Rosalind Franklin University in Chicago, and then completed residency at Stanford Hospital. He trained at Oregon Health Services University for fellowship and did an MBA at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York. He currently serves as the medical director of palliative care in Sonoma and serves on the board of Providence Medical Group of Northern California, along with several committees at the hospital and medical group. In his free time, Dr. Ramchandani enjoys running golfing, coaching, and watching baseball, and is a lifelong Warriors, Giants, and 49ers fan. He serves as team physician for the Sonoma Stompers. Dr. Ram Chandani? Hello. Hopefully everyone's doing well. I'm going to get my slide deck up right now. And here we go. We're going to talk a little bit about advancing techniques for alleviating back and neck pain. Again, if you have any questions, you can put it in the chat box. The agenda today, is, I'm going to first talk about who I am, or who am I, the anatomy of the back and the neck, types and symptoms of back-related and neck-related pain, and then the techniques that I use to alleviate these types of pain management. So this is a little bit about me. Thank you, Tom, for the introduction. You can see this is my family up here on the top left my parents and my kids and my wife. And I thank them for how far I've achieved in life, as well as all the different places I've worked and studied, et cetera. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of the spine. The spine is a very unique thing. It's, a, it's essentially an organ that has many bones that actually carry the spinal cord all the way down from the brain to the to the extremities. So within the spine, we have the vertebral foramens that go all the way up and down from the cerebral or from the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar area, as well as the sacrum and coccyx. And within the vertebral foramen, the spinal cord travels. So from there come the spinal nerves and other things. The main thing I'm gonna focus on today is the bones, the joints, the muscles, and the nerves. So those are the main items, which is pretty much everything. Now there are discs as well in the middle, which is something that no other part of the body has. So let's go to the next slide here. So the parts of the spine, we start with, with the head, and then we have the cervical spine above that. We actually have 
C1 through, through 7, which are the seven cervical vertebral bodies. But there are eight spinal nerves in the cerebral, in the cervical area. The thoracic area has T1 through 12, which has, again, 12 spinal nerves and 12 vertebral bodies. The unique part about the thoracic area is that the ribs come off the thoracic spine. So we actually have a connection between this, the thoracic spine and the ribs. The lumbar spine is L1 through L5, which is which have the same amount of nerves. And then we have the sacrum, which is actually one big fused vertebrae. And that one goes from S1 through S4. Some people actually can have an L6. So you can actually have a sixth lumbar vertebrae. And some people don't have a fifth lumbar vertebrae. So some people actually have four. These are normal variants and sometimes can cause pain and sometimes doesn't. It all depends on the person. So from the sacrum, again, there are four there are actually four nerves that come out of that one vertebral body. So we call that S1 through S4. And then there's the coccyx, which is below that. Around those areas are the muscles, which are listed there on that picture. You can see how many different types of muscles we have in our back, just right next to our spine, in the lumbar spine, the thoracic spine, and the cervical spine. Then we have the joints. Unique joints, including the facet joints, which are in between each vertebral body. The sacroiliac joint, which is a very unique joint. This is between the sacrum, which is at the bottom of the spine again, and the pelvis, which is the, the hip bone. So we have a special joint there called the sacroiliac joint. There are also the non-spine joints, which are called the costochondral joints. These are between the rib cage and the spine. So there are those. And then, of course, we talked about the discs and the bones. The bones, the vertebrae are very unique as well. And I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes here. So the types and symptoms of back pain. When I have patients that come to me with back pain, they usually say, hey, I have sciatica. And there are, uh, some people do have sciatica, but I classify back pain as two different types. One is what we call posterior back pain. This is the backside of the spine. So this is more towards the, your, your backside. The anterior back pain is more towards the front side. This is sides, the side we can't see as easily. So backside pain or posterior back pain is more common than anterior back pain. We usually see these patients with more pain when they bend backwards. The pain resolves or gets better with sitting and lying, and the pain can radiate to the legs and can only be in the legs. This is still considered back pain if they have pain just in the legs. Now, that is not all pain in the legs, but this particular type of posterior back pain when it's radiating to the legs can be classified as sciatica. Now, anterior back pain, the front of the vertebral body or the front of the spine, is due to the vertebrae and sometimes the disc and you can see in this picture that the vertebral disc is right there in the middle of the vertebrae. And it can actually protrude to the back and cause posterior back pain, but sometimes the disc itself can cause anterior back pain or front back pain. This is more due to when you, when you bend forward, you get pain with that. You can actually get more pain with sitting and lying, and pain does not resolve completely with sitting. Pain actually gets worse sometimes with sitting. And the pain is usually only in the low back. Now, sometimes it can be in other spots, but usually it's only in the low back. And then of course you can have both of these, which becomes more complicated and then we have to treat both. So I have many people again that tell me that they have sciatica. Again, sciatica is posterior back pain. This is low back pain that radiates to the legs and possibly the feet. If you look at the picture there, there are, there's a diagram of all the different areas of the nerves in the spine and actually where the nerves of the spine travel to. So you can look in the neck there, we actually have pain that can radiate from the neck to the hands and that can be caused by posterior back pain or posterior neck pain. This is not called sciatica, this is called a cervical radiculopathy. It's not ridiculous, it can cause a lot of pain, but it is also caused by posterior back, posterior neck pain. Now, you can have the same thing in your low back down to your legs. And this usually causes pain that is numb, numbness, burning, tingling, things like that. 
Not always is it like that, but so, most of the time it is. So key point here, sciatica isn't low back pain that radiates to the like the buttocks area. That usually isn't sciatica, but it can be. The pain on the side of the hips is usually not sciatica, but again, it can't be. Now, pain in the buttocks can be sciatica, but most of the time it isn't. Pain anywhere in the back that is not radiating to the legs, again, is usually not classified as sciatica. Pain that is on the front of the legs is usually not sciatica as well. And pain that is in the back of the leg, or pain that is in the leg, but without back pain, can be classified as sciatica, but usually isn't. So again, we're going to talk a little bit more about posterior back pain. And I just talked about sciatica a whole bunch. Of, but what is sciatica? We talk about this where we talk about, oh, this patient has sciatica. It's usually caused actually by a nerve root that's being pinched in the spine. This can be in the neck or the low back. Now, specifically here, I'm showing a disc bulge that's being, that's or actually a herniated disc, which is worse than a bulged disc. So this is where the disc is actually protruding through the disc annulus, which is the outside of the disc. And this pinches on one of the nerves that's coming out of the spine. And this is called sciatica or can be called a radiculopathy, as I mentioned earlier. This can happen in the neck and the low back. And most of the things I'm talking about here can happen in the neck and the low back. Central canal stenosis is where the nerves in the middle of the spine are being pinched by either bone, nerve, or uh, bone, disc, ligament, something else. So we can have this pinching of the nerve that actually, or all the nerves in the center of the spine that can cause weakness, pain, and radiation to the legs, which can be similar to a radiculopathy, but isn't a typical radiculopathy. So these patients, usually the typical signs of radiculopathy when we do an examination don't show up. And the MRI has these classical findings. On the, on the right side, this is an example of someone with central canal stenosis. And you can see there that where the arrows are, the, the area between those two is not the same as above that. So that is where it's being pinched, and that is causing central canal stenosis. Now, sacroiliac joint pain is in the low back and is between the sacrum and the iliac area. Now, this pain is very similar to joint pain, can be similar to facet pain, and can mimic either or both. Now, facet pain is also back pain, and that is by the joints in the low back. And that can mimic all of these things as well. Anterior spine pain. So anterior spine pain can be caused by ver vertebrae that have problems. So one of the things that can happen is the vertebrae can have some swelling, and this can be due to degenerating discs. On an MRI, we see what we call modic changes. These modic changes can show up on MRIs and can be of three types. There's modic one, modic two, and modic three. Now, we don't know exactly why we see those changes in the MRI, but we what we do know is that these patients with vertebrogenic pain can have severe pain and can have these modic changes. So if we see these modic changes, we ask the patient what type of pain they have. And if it comes to be anterior pain or anterior spine pain, we would actually see that they have, we would classify them as vertebrogenic pain. And then there are ways to treat that as well. Another type of anterior pain can be caused by a vertebral compression fracture. This is sometimes happens when a patient has osteoporosis which is caused by decreased bone density. And decreased bone density happens because patients don't have enough calcium. They can be on steroids, can be caused by cancer, can be caused by other types of trauma. And, and what can happen is that their bone actually squashes down to, to what you see on the right. So if you see the top vertebrae there, and that one, I'm gonna actually put a little, laser pointer on this, which is kind of cool. So this, this one over here, you can see that the bone density is much greater than the one over here. So this one has less bone density, and this would be a small compression fracture. This one over here has a pretty severe compression fracture, and this one also has a compression fracture. So that's kind of what we see on the MRI is that these bones are compressed. 
You can also see that on an x-ray. Now the area can have severe pain in the low back, can have severe pain in any part of the spine where the compression fracture is. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about neck pain. Again, neck pain can be caused by a pinched nerve, which is radiating from the neck down to the hand and arm. It feels like pins and needles. It can involve weakness, but usually more what we call spasms, so patients actually have tightness. You can also have facet-related pain, which is the joints in the back. This is, again, posterior neck pain. It can feel like tightness, can be associated with headaches, can be associated with tight muscles. It can radiate to the shoulders, or the pain could just be in the shoulders from the facets. These are some patterns of where facetogenic pain, what we call facetogenic pain, can be referred to. So some people can have where they have C2, 3 pain, they can actually have pain in their head and have a headache. C3, 4 can be in the net back of the neck and all the way down to the shoulders. And C5, 6 can entirely be down in the shoulders and can be above that area where the scapula is or the, sh or the shoulder blade is. So we can have pain in lots of areas from these facets. Now, one of the things that can disguise as a neck issue and sometimes can be confusing for physicians as well as patients is that you can have arm numbness and pain and even neck numbness and pain, but they're actually caused by not the neck. They're caused by something else. It can be caused by a nerve, a nerve that's being damaged in the arm. And that can actually cause some weakness, less spasms, but more weakness in those areas. So treatments for back and neck pain. One of the things, of course, is an epidural, and that's what a lot of patients get. But I'm going to start with things that aren't so invasive, because a lot of people don't need injections or surgery for their pain. They can be managed pretty well with physical therapy, which can include stretching, strengthening, manual manipulation, heat and ice. There's also a lot of other things that physical therapy can offer you, including pressure point release and other things like that, that can be very beneficial. There's ultrasound therapy. There's red light therapy, which is kind of new on the scene. It's also known as infrared therapy. There's a TENS unit, which is demonstrated here on the right. You can put a TENS unit with TENS pads, and this can give electrical stimulation to the back directly on the skin. That's why it's called transcutaneous electrical nerve root stimulation. Chiropractic therapy can help osteopathy can help, and medications can help. So one of the things I do pretty commonly as far as procedures to help patients out is doing epidurals. Now, these aren't the typical epidurals as pregnancy because we use an x-ray to guide where our needle goes. So when a patient is pregnant and they actually have a pregnancy epidural, we don't use any x-ray because that can harm the baby. So we don't use that type of epidural when we do when we do these epidurals. We actually use an x-ray, we numb the skin, we go through very carefully to get to that spot. Now, we also do what's called transforaminal epidurals, which we go into the foramina, which is on the side of the spinal canal. And that is completely different than a pregnancy epidural and actually has nothing to do with that. The only difference is that it also goes into what we call the epidural space. And the epidural space isn't right on the spinal canal. It's actually outside of that. And the point of the epidural is to decrease the amount of pain from radiculopathy or central stenosis. And sometimes in the past, we've done up to three at a time, but normally now we only do one at a time every few, few weeks to few months. Now for joint pain or, or facetogenic pain, we do what's called a medial branch block. And this is a diagnostic procedure where we block the nerves that go to the, to the joints. This can be done in the neck and the back, al along with epidurals. This can be done in the neck and the back and the thoracic spine. And if these, these can, injections can be done with or without sedation at the office or at a surgery center. And we can do what's called a rhizotomy or a radiofrequency ablation of these same nerves that can give a longer term pain, that can give longer term pain relief. And this can last six months, six years, or even longer sometimes. Alternatively, we can do what's called a facet joint injection, which is kind of like a knee injection where we actually inject some steroid into those areas. 
And you can see on the right side, there are the different areas of facetogenic pain in the low back. One of the more advanced techniques is called a spinal cord stimulator. We do this for patients with radiculopathy that cannot be operated upon or someone that's had previous back surgery that continues to have pain. We do this in an outpatient setting. So patients that have this put in don't require to stay in a hospital overnight. It does requ require a trial and a psychological screen prior to an implant. Pain management physicians and spine physicians can both implant them. An intrathecal pump is often used for cancer pain, spasticity, or chronic pain. So intrathecal pumps are something where we actually have medicine that's in the pump that goes directly to the spine and into the spinal canal. Again, we require a trial, sometimes a psychological sc screen. And this is done for patients with severe pain, sometimes with paraplegia or quadriplegia, and the patient has severe spasms. We can use that for, we can use this for that as well. Kyphoplasty is when someone has a compression fracture. This is where we actually go into the, into the vert vertebral body and we put in a balloon and then we actually put in some cement into the vertebral body. This stabilizes the fracture and takes care of patient's pain. This can be done in the thoracic or the lumbar spine. Unfortunately, it's not available in the cervical spine. And finally, the basi vertebral nerve ablation. This is a newer procedure. It's called an intercept procedure, where we actually go into the vertebrae as well, and we treat the nerve, which is called the basi vertebral nerve, with an ablation, like a radiofrequency ablation. And we ablate the nerve in the posterior of the spine, and this gets rid of low back pain. It is one of the better known treatments for this type of back pain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Ramchandani. Absolutely wonderful presentation. And uh, the information just for, for my own uh, edification on the SI joint was, uh, was enlightening, especially how it is uh, capable of referring into other areas. Um, so thank you very much for that presentation. Uh, now, it is my distinct pleasure to now introduce Dr. Remy Ajaboye. Uh, Dr. Ajaboye is a board-certified spine specialist trained in surgical and non-surgical management of spine conditions. He has advanced fellowship training in minimally invasive spine surgery and complex spinal reconstruction for conditions involving the cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. He did complete his graduate, undergraduate studies at UC Berkeley, followed by medical school at UC Santa, San Francisco and an orthopedic surgery residency at UCLA, uh, where he served as chief resident, not that we're showing favoritism, he then completed a minimally invasive spine surgery and spine, spinal reconstruction fellowship training at Stanford University, where he also served as a clinical instructor. He's written over 40 papers and book chapters and presented his findings at many national and international conferences. Dr. Remy Adjaboye's treatment philosophy is to use the least invasive means possible to help relieve pain and improve a patient's quality of life. And in his free time, Dr. Adjaboye spends time with his family, cooking, trying new restaurants, and rooting for the Los Angeles Lakers. Uh, <laughs> Dr. Ajiboye, all yours. Thank you for the uh, thank you for that introduction, Tom. Um, today I'll be discussing uh, minimally invasive surgical options uh, to manage uh, neck and back pain. Um, the objective of my uh, talk today will be to do a brief introduction to spinal anatomy, and then uh, I'll go over some of the concerning symptoms uh, that uh, patients typically present with that are associated with uh, neck and back pain. Uh, and then I'll go over some uh, a minimal invasive uh, surgical options uh, to address neck and back pain. Um, I know Dr. Ramchandani spent a fair amount of time on anatomy, so I won't uh, spend so much time on this, but uh, this is just a basic overview of what an MRI of the lower back looks like on this uh, left side of the screen. Uh, I call this a side profile of the spine, meaning this is the, the front of the spine is here, uh, and the back of the spine is here. The, the spine is made up of these bones, the vertebrae, the building block of the spine. Um, and in between the building block is the area marked in circle and the red circle, which are the disc, which is served as a cushion uh, between the bones. And behind those structures are where the nerves are located. So the gray structure here are the nerves and the lighter structure is just the spinal fluid, which is actually a nutrient supply for the nerves. This is what a lower back MRI looks like, what we call a sagittal MRI. 
Uh, on the right side, this is where the neck one looks like. Very similar. Front is here. Uh, back is here. Uh, the bones are the vertebrae. And then the uh, disc of the cushion between the bones. And then the spinal cord is this gray structure here with the white spinal fluid in front and behind the spinal cord. So this is what normal anatomy looks like. Uh, when patients present in my office, uh, uh, these are the symptoms that make me concerned, right? So when someone comes in with uh, neck pain with numbness or tingling uh, down into the shoulder area or down to the arm or hands, it makes me think that there might be a nerve somewhere which is either being compressed or the nerve is inflamed or irritated. Um, similarly, for the lower back area, patients can oftentimes present with uh, numbness, tingling pain into the buttock, hip, thigh, leg, or foot. And depending on which specific nerve is uh, compressed determines which specific area the pain radiates into. So whenever I hear patients uh, complain with back or neck pain with and without ar with uh, arm or leg symptoms, uh, it makes me worry that there's a nerve somewhere that's not happy. And that nerve is essentially given a warning signal that something is wrong with it. And that's the reason why people usually get this uh, numbness, tingling symptoms down into the arms or legs. Other symptoms that make me concerned uh, when patients present in my office are uh, any signs of uh, weakness or atrophy. So the job of the nerve, the, the nerve itself serves as the command center uh, for the muscles, right? So without the uh, nerves, uh, the muscles are essentially useless. And so when a nerve is pinched somewhere, it can no longer do its job and communicate properly to the muscle. And patients would typically then start to develop weakness from that. If that weakness uh, uh, goes on for a long period of time, then the muscles will, to, will start to shrink away and atrophy. And that's usually not a good thing because uh, once atrophy sets in, it's oftentimes uh, difficult to reverse that, right? So when someone presents with this, it makes me very worried about a nerve compression. Um, other problems were, uh, make us concerned and when patients uh, complain of changes to the bowel or bladder function. So similar to the muscles in the arms and legs, uh, the bladder is also a muscle, and so are the sphincters around the anus. And when those muscles are no longer being, uh, uh, are no longer receiving the proper signal from the nerves, it starts to become weak. So the bladder cannot contract or squeeze properly, and patients will oftentimes present with difficulty with urinating. Uh, obviously, this can be a, a multifactorial uh, problem, uh, especially in older men with prostate problems. But if someone presents with back issues with bladder problems, my job is to ensure that the nerves that are innervating those bladder muscles are, are not being compressed. Uh, other things that make us worried are people who present in my office, for example, with frequent falls or difficulty with uh, hand coordination. So think about it, the way I think about it is the, the brain is trying to tell your arms and legs to do certain things, right? That signal has to go through your spinal cord and the nerves. When there's a blockage somewhere around the, along that pathway, uh, there's a disconnect. Uh, and so people oftentimes try to walk and just have a difficulty controlling their steps. Um, I have patients that sometimes will present with difficulty with simple tasks like buttoning their shirts, uh, or they notice that their handwriting is getting worse, right? These are things that make us worry that, that, that there's severe nerve compression somewhere along that spinal pathway. Uh, lastly, um, something else we tend to worry about or look for in patients who present with neck or back pain are uh, patients that have any, uh, what we'll call uh, constitutional symptoms. These are symptoms of you know, fever, unintentional weight loss, night sweats, or nighttime pain. These are red flag symptoms that make us worried about things like infections or cancer. Uh, most people may not realize this, but the spine is actually one of the most common sites for uh, infections from the blood to spread into or from cancer from other parts of the body to spread into. And, uh, and this has to do with the fact that there's a lot of uh, rich uh, blood supply around the spine. So anything that travels through the blood, whether it's a bacteria or a fungus or a cancer that spreads, it's easy for them to go into the spine. And so we always check and screen patients for any of these symptoms anytime they uh, present with neck or back pain. Uh, in terms of when surgery should be considered, uh, my philosophy is surgery should be considered for patients who have concerning symptoms, whether it's you know, symptoms of infections or cancers, or people who have, uh, or starting to develop weakness or atrophy in their muscles, uh, people that are having uh, changes to a bowel or bladder function, uh, people that are at risk of having severe permanent nerve damage. Uh, at the same time, in patients who have persistent debilitating symptoms, who have tried some or all of some of the non-operative options that Dr. Ramachandani went over, then surgery can be an option for them if their MRI correlates with their uh, exam findings and their complaints. Whenever surgery is being considered, we try whenever we can 
to go with a minimally invasive approach. Uh, and this is a, 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 a unique way of doing spine surgery, which is different from the traditional way of doing an you know, open back surgery or open neck surgery. And the idea of a minimally invasive spine surgery is how do we treat a spine problem uh, while at the same time minimizing any sort of damage to the surrounding muscles and surrounding structures? So we typically do these through tubes and specialized retractors through very small incisions, which allow uh, uh, us to minimize any sort of blood loss, which leads to decreased scarring, decreased pain. Uh, these surgeries are oftentimes outpatient surgeries. Uh, and if they do stay in the hospital, it's usually about a day or so. And this allows patients to essentially get back to a you know, faster uh, return to their normal activities. Uh, there's several types of minimal invasive spine surgeries that we do. Um, we can do nerve decompression with minimal invasive techniques. We can do nerve decompression along with motion preservation or restoration type surgeries, such as what we call artificial disc replacements. We can also do nerve decompression along with spine stabilization different types of procedures called fusion surgeries. Uh, this is an example of a patient with a, a disc herniation in their neck between C6 and C7, okay? Uh, the disc itself is like a jelly donut, and so when that donut has a hole in it, it allows the internal jelly to leak out, which can, which can pinch the spinal cord or the nerve roots. Uh, in patients with this in the neck area, one way to address this is through the back of the neck called a foraminotomy. This involves using a small tube, less than an inch or so. Uh, we can dock that down onto the spine and shave down some of this bone uh, behind where the nerve is and then access the nerve and free it up and take out those herniated disc fragments. This is usually an outpatient surgery that takes about an hour or so to do. People are out of the hospital uh, the same day of surgery. So this can be a really good minimally invasive spine surgery option through the back of the neck. Uh, other surgeries we do for the neck uh, through the front are uh, uh, typically what we call anterior uh, cervical decompression and fusion or what we call artificial disc replacement. Uh, these two surgeries function, uh, the similarities between two sur these two surgeries is that you go through the front of the neck, okay, you take out a bad disc or diseased disc, uh, which is pinching a nerve and you free up the nerve. The historical way of doing this procedure is to do a fusion, meaning once you take out that disc and you free up the nerve, you're now left with an empty space uh, where the disc used to be, which is this, essentially the space between the two bones. Uh, historically, we we'll put a piece of bone in that, into that area uh, and put a, a plate uh, that has holes in it for screws and secure the, the bone above and below that disc together, which fuses that joint and immobilizes that joint, which allows those two bones to grow together, almost like trying to heal up two pieces of a broken bone together. Uh, more recently, we've been doing more and more of what we call artificial disc replacement. It's similar to a fusion in that you go through the front of the neck, you take out the bad disc, you free up the nerve, but instead of putting a piece of bone in there and locking up that joint, we put a mobile joint in there, which has a plastic in between, almost like having a hip or a knee replacement surgery, right? And this essentially helps to uh, maintain motion uh, in, in the cervical spine and the neck area. Uh, this is a, a video that sort of illustrates um, uh, uh, this technology. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, what an artificial disc in the neck looks like. This allows for uh, forward as well as a, a forward bending as well as backward bending of the neck, which helps to you know, maintain motion in the neck area. You can also have a, a continuous side to side bending through the area where you put an artificial disc in, again, similar to a, a knee or hip replacement. This is in contrast to a fusion where you put a plate or and screws, you mobilize those joints. And the problem is that this limits motion and can also oftentimes put a lot of stress in the joint above and below where the fusion was done, which can sometimes accelerate the process of those other joints uh, deteriorating in the future. In the lower back area, in the lower back area, uh, there are also options uh, for uh, decompression. So most people have probably heard of something called a laminectomy uh, or laminotomy or microdiscectomy. A laminectomy just means there's a bone in the back of the spine called a lamina, and you're taking out that entire bone in its entirety uh, to access the spinal canal and to decompress a, a severely pinched spinal canal. In contrast, a laminotomy just means you're taking out just a part of that bone, not the entire thing. And this can also allow you to access the spinal canal and decompress a, a pinched nerve, take down bone spurs, and take out herniated disc fragments. 
Uh, these surgeries can typically be performed, uh, again, through a small tube, less than one inch. Uh, these are usually outpatient surgeries uh, uh, that can be done. Uh, and, and through this tube, uh, you can access the spinal canal, free up a pinched nerve, take down bone spurs, take out disc fragments, uh, and patients have pretty good uh, success with this surgery. Now, and for the lower back, there are also other surgeries that we do. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms usually thrown around in the lower back area. I'm sure people have heard of the word ALIF or T-LIF or a, a, a PLIF. Uh, these essentially are acronyms that talk about how you access uh, the spine, the lower back area. So for example, if you're accessing the spine through the front, like the abdomen, we call that an anterior lumbar fusion. If you access it in the spine through the side, we call that a lateral lumbar fusion. If you access it in the spine through the back, we call it a posterior lumbar fusion. Uh, and these, uh, uh, when you access the spine through these ways, you can either do what we call an artificial disc replacement, you can do also, or you can do a fusion. So if this is an example, this first x-ray here of a patient who has an artificial disc replacement, right? Similar to what I went over for the neck area. Uh, this is done between the L4 and L5. Uh, you can basically go through the front of the spine Take out a bad disc, clean out the nerves, and then put an artificial joint in there, which helps to preserve motion. Now, the uh, outcome uh, in the literature for disc replacement surgery in the lower back, it is not as good as uh, the result in the neck. So in general, we tend to do a lot more disc replacement surgeries in the neck than we do in the lower back area. Uh, the result in the neck are fantastic, uh, and the, uh, the ones in the lower back are just not as good as the neck area. Uh, the second x-ray shows an example of a patient who had, had what we call anterior lumbar fusion through the front. You can see this big titanium cage or a spacer here, which is now replaced where the disc used to be. And then you stabilize the surgeries uh, through the back with these screws called pedicle screws. Uh, this third x-ray is an example of a, a, a titanium spacer or uh, a cage, which is put in through the side. And then similarly, there's screws through the back that, that basically help to reinforce the stability of that, uh, of that fusion. And then on the fourth uh, uh, slide here is uh, uh, what we call the posterior inner body fusion, meaning you can take out the disc, free up the nerve through the back, you can put a titanium spacer in there with screws and rods and those secured in place, which allows those bones to fuse together. Again, this can all be done through minimally invasive surgical means through incisions that are about uh, uh, less than one inch or so. What a lot of these procedures have in common is the fact that we use a lot of screws and instrumentation into the spine. Um, to help to uh, safely uh, place this instrumentation, uh, uh, we uh, tend to use a, a robot. Uh, this is an example of something called the Globus Excelsis GPS Spinal Robot. And this is now available uh, for, uh, to use at many uh, Providence uh, facilities. Uh, the idea of robotic uh, guidance and navigation is that this, this robot essentially allows us to place instrumented implants through a, uh, uh, a planned trajectory in a very, very precise fashion. I'm talking about within millimeters of accuracy. And then we incorporate that with what we call a navigation, which is like a GPS system, right, which provides real-time visualization of where the instruments are in the patient's uh, anatomy uh, while you're in surgery. This is, an, this is an example of what that looks like. So usually a patient is laying on the operating room table and we bring this machine in, which is like an intraoperative or in, uh, CAT scan. So this machine comes into the, uh, into the OR, gets a CAT scan of the patient laying on the table. And based on this CAT scan, okay, we can then plan our screw trajectory right there in real time. You can pick the screw sizes, the screw length, the width of the screw, the exact trajectory you want the screw to go into. And once that's set, uh, the robotic arm then comes in and docks exactly in your planned trajectory. I'm talking about within a millimeter of accuracy, right? Uh, which can be a big deal in the spine where you're trying to uh, navigate some very narrow corridors to safely place this instrument. Again, this is a great technology that a lot of Providence systems have now. Um, another, uh, um, type of minimally invasive spine surgery that I offer for the lower back is something called awake spine surgery. Uh, this is a unique procedure. It's essentially having spine surgery done with no general anesthesia, meaning there's no tube that's inserted down into your throat. We essentially do this with just local anesthesia and some light IV sedation, almost like having a colonoscopy. Uh, when we do this, we tend to achieve better pain control uh, because uh, we minimize narcotic use 
Uh, patients are up and up and walking within 10 to 15 minutes after surgery. And I like, I really like this procedure for a lot of my older patients who are, you know, have health problems or health issues who you're trying to avoid some of the complications that can come with general anesthesia, such as, you know, breathing problems or heart problems or confusion or delirium or fogginess after surgery. Uh, this is a, a Health Matters article that was published in our local uh, Providence uh, uh, Health Matters magazine about a physician in our community who I did the surgery on. Uh, this gentleman actually was referred to me uh, because he was having severe pain into his buttock and hip area. He was completely hunched over. He actually started off with a, uh, with a joint replacement surgeon who actually gave him a hip replacement. And after his hip replacement, they realized the hip was not the source of his pain. It was actually referred to me for the evaluation, and I found out that he had a cyst in his spine. Uh, he wanted to have this fixed. Uh, he did not want general anesthesia. And I was able to do the surgery for him through a less than one inch incision, outpatient surgery. Within literally 10 minutes from surgery, he was up and walking, and the severe pain that is dealt with for years immediately gone after surgery. And again, this helps to avoid, and we were able to avoid any use of any general anesthesia for this case. Uh, so this is a very unique surgical option, I think, for the right patient uh, who is hoping to uh, avoid uh, any of the risk of general anesthesia. Lastly, I would like to end this talk um, by sharing the story of a patient of mine. Uh, and the reason why is because I've spent all this time talking about in a minimally invasive spine surgery. And it's important to uh, point out that not all spine problems can be treated with minimally invasive spine surgery, right? And some patients... You have to do the surgery in the traditional open way. Uh, this patient of mine, uh, when I did her surgery, uh, she was 75 years old. Uh, she was a uh, she's a retired police officer. She was injured uh, while in the force about 40 years ago, and she sustained several fractures in her spine. And over the years, those fractures led to scoliosis, which is kind of what you see here, which is a sideways curvature of the spine, in addition to what we call kyphosis, which is a forward bending of the spine. In addition to that, she also developed a lot of uh, a nerve compression and was dealing with a lot of shooting pain, numbness, and tingling down into her legs. Uh, I did a complex spinal reconstructive surgery on her to address her scoliosis, her kyphosis, uh, as well as her stenosis, which is a nerve compression. Uh, this is a, a, a recent article that was published in her in our local ministry's Health Matters magazine. Here she is at 79 years old. Okay, This is all the hardware that's in her back. Okay, she's got screws and rods essentially from the neck all the way down to her pelvis. And this is her at 79 years old training to be a bodybuilder. Okay. Uh, the, the point is that um, patients need to be taken care of by surgeons that have the right training and expertise to perform these surgeries, um, whether or not it's through minimal invasive way or traditional uh, way. But the key is that these surgeries have to be performed right, by the right surgeon with the right expertise and the right training at uh, facilities like the Providence Health System that have these advanced cutting edge technologies like the spinal robot uh, in order for them to achieve really great outcomes after surgery so that hopefully they can also leave a, uh, go back to living a, a pain-free um, active uh, lifestyle again. Uh, thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Ajaboye. Uh, I'm just... It's, it continues to amaze me, and I know we do this for a living, at the number of options and the number of choices that you have at your, uh, at your leisure to be able to help fix an enormous uh, uh, group within our population. Uh, and the, the, obviously the work with the uh, scoliosis patient was, uh, uh, was beautiful from a medical standpoint, but what an amazing outcome as well. The, uh, um, now, Oops, my video was not on. Sorry about that. Um, now, before we begin our question and answer, we absolutely have a actually have some questions for you, our participants. Um, please answer the poll that you see on your screen and give us your honest feedback. We would greatly appreciate it. Um, that will be extremely helpful too for us as we move into our other uh, uh, lectures in the future, working within our community for Providence. And now we will go ahead and begin our question and answer. And feel free to continue to ask questions in the question and answer box. And we will do our best to be able to get to them. Um, and then just please understand that once we kind of get to about 629, give or take, uh, that will most likely be our last question for the day. 
Um, and but we will continue to work uh, hard to to try to answer all question and answers even uh, upon the completion of this uh, lecture. Um, now I've been kind of monitoring and answering a few questions as well uh, as we've been doing this. And let me just ask um, Dr. Ajaboye, let me ask you first. It's the one that's sitting right in front of my face. Um, one of our one of our attendees is asking. What factors actually determine the direction you will take when you're doing your spine repair, anterior, lateral, posterior, right. combined? That's a, right. That's an excellent uh, question. Uh, there's a lot of uh, art and science with spine surgery, right? So uh, some of the factors that determine what approach we use has to do with one, where's the, where's the problem, okay? Uh, how many levels are involved? Right? Are we talking about just one problem at, at one disc space? Are we talking about multiple discs? Um, what is the patient's what does the patient's alignment look like? So um, historically, um, surgeons did not pay attention to what we call spinal alignment, meaning the way a patient stands, right? Um, and many many years ago, uh, we when spinal fusions were being done. Uh, patients were uh, getting fused in what we call flat back, meaning the lower back is meant to have a natural sway back, a natural curve to it. That's what allows you to stand upright. When you fuse the spine in the, in the wrong alignment, you tend to keep this, fuse the spine in a straight up position, which completely uh, prevents a patient from being able to stand up straight after a fusion. So uh, through x-rays and measurements that we perform, we can literally measure exactly how much of what we call lordosis, which is a curvature in the back, needs to be dialed in for an individual patient. And that oftentimes is actually what determines the best approach. So the best way, for example, to restore that curve back into the spine is actually through the, either the front or through the side. So if someone has already presented to me with a bit of a flat back, I want to make sure I either go through the front or through the side because that allows me to put a, a, a nice wedge of titanium spacer into where that disc is to build that curve back into their spine to allow them to stand upright again. So that's just one of the many factors to be taken into consideration. Fascinating. Uh, thank you for that. And, you know, um, what in monitoring the, the Q&A here, there were a number of uh, questions that came up uh, in and around uh, the use of steroids, uh, which are commonly used um, uh, in some of the uh, issues that we will come across uh, with low back pain and, and neck pain and such. And Dr. Ramchandani, you know, I guess my first question would be is, um, when are the common, uh, what are the common reasons we might use steroids for injections? And um, I'll, we'll start with that and then I'll kind of piggyback on that. Excellent. Thank you, Tom. And thank you for the opportunity to give this presentation. So the steroids are used for multiple different things. Usually we use them for epidural steroid injections, as they're called epidural steroid injections. So we use them for that. We also use them for facet joint injections, where we actually go, in, go into the facet. And they can be used all around the body for different types of injections. They can also be given for even chemotherapy and other things that are not related to the spine. So we use them a lot and they're used for decreasing inflammation specifically to that, to that spot of the body. But if we give it IV then we're, or orally, we may be trying to trigger less inflammation throughout the body with that steroid. Excellent, thank you for that. And then, um, you know, the, one of the questions that came on is, are, are there any um, issues as far as um, uh, re, uh, taking, uh, taking these uh, steroid injections, um, i.e., is there a certain number that they, a person can receive uh, a year, and, and what might be some of the issues uh, by receiving too much or taking too much uh, steroids? So steroids can cause many side effects. Uh, for example, some of the steroids can cause people to be a little bit more agitated or can cause their, if someone has bipolar syndrome, can cause them to have mania, can cause issues with sleep, can cause issues with cataracts, but that's usually with long-term usage. So we don't like to use it, use steroids long-term, but for single-time injections, it's usually not a big deal. And usually we can do up to three injections in a body part or part of the body every year. Now, 
some patients have to be on steroids long term for rheumatological conditions and things like that. And that's when those side effects come upon come upon us for the most part. So the answer is not straightforward, but for the most part, you know, three steroid injections in a year is usually what we say in a cert certain part of the body, especially the spine. Right. Thank you very much for that. And I hope that helps. Uh, there were a number of questions in, in and around steroid injections. Um, now, this is an interesting one. And, and I think the last couple of times we've done these uh, convers these uh, lectures, this has not come up. But Dr. Ajiboye, you know, you do an absolutely amazing surgery. You have some implants that you use, but maybe the patient has to go through an MRI. Can they have an MRI after having these uh, surgeries? Absolutely, yes. So the vast majority of implants that we use for spine surgery now are usually titanium-based uh, implants. Uh, and they're MRI safe. Um, so you can you can have screws and rods from your neck all the way down to the pelvis and get into an MRI machine. It's not a problem. Uh, another question I often get asked is, uh, will I set up the alarm at the airport? <laughs> and most times, you actually don't. Uh, I've had patients tell me the same airport, 10 times, never set up the alarm. Once in a while, they're random set up the alarm, uh, but usually it doesn't. You don't need any kind of special card that says that uh, you have implants in your body or anything. Uh, the exceptions uh, for MRI is usually uh, typically pacemakers, so patients with pacemakers or patients with certain um, spinal cord stimulators that are not MRI compatible. Um, that can be an issue, for, but, but for most spinal hardwares, uh, whether it's a neck or the back, uh, it's usually not an issue. Uh, now, sometimes the magnets will uh, react with the metal, meaning that the area where you're trying to see, you may not get as good of a signal there, uh, from basically from noise from the metal of the implant reacting with the MRI. But there's certain MRI sequences that can be done to avoid that, or you can go to a less powerful MRI machine to take care of that problem. But for the most part, you can get an MRI even with spinal hardware in place. Thank you for that. And thank you for the, uh, the airport uh, add-on too. That was good. I was going to follow up with that. You, you're right on there. Um, so Dr. Ram Chandani and, and Dr. Ajiboya, I, I'd love to hear your guys' approach on this and thoughts on this. Um, and I, I'm staring at one of the questions here and they, they talk about Western medicine and I'm a physical therapist by training uh, and, um, and such. And so I, I have, of course, uh, I don't want to say a bias or however, how, but there is a, a, a question how often do you find that some of those, what they call alternative treatments, even though I don't feel they're alternative, um, and the use of massage, acupuncture, chiropractic, uh, you know, is that something that commonly you will, you will um, endorse for your patients? I always say, try the least invasive thing first. So for the most part, those things can be the first thing that patients would try and that I would suggest to the patient. And oftentimes when they come to me, they've already tried those things, but oftentimes patients get better with simple things like chiropractic, um, stretching, exercising, strengthening parts of the body. So yeah, I definitely think that other things other than our Western techniques can be beneficial. I, I, I personally, as a spine surgeon, probably recommend acupuncture to probably about a third of patients that I see on a weekly basis. Uh, I'm, a, I'm a believer in it. I don't know how it works. Um, it's, you know, it's Eastern medicine, uh, but I've had a lot of patients have good success with it. Uh, and one of my mentors used to always say, you know, acupuncture has been, has been practiced by billions of people for thousands of years. And so it's, it's gotta, it's gotta, it's gotta have some efficacy to it, you know, for it to be around for that long. So I'm, I'm a minimal business spine surgeon by, by, by every definition of that term, meaning whatever the least invasive way it is it takes to get you better, that's all I care about. Whether it's non-surgery or surgical options, I just want patients to be better with the least invasive means possible. And if acupuncture is what's going to do it, then I say go for it. I truly appreciate that. Um, and then, again, another the, the the questions have been fantastic, by the way, and I applaud the, uh, uh, the attendees. Um, because this is an interesting question because it's, this is something that seems to be showing up and I'm gonna to add to this question if I can. Um, presently, is there any, any research um, that is supporting the use of um, stem cell injections, uh, yeah, uh, bone marrow, 
uh, injections, um, PRP, uh, when it comes to the treatment of back pain. I can take that. Um, PRP and regenerative techniques have been have been started to, you know, they've been studying these for the last few years and none of them have been approved by the FDA as of yet. But at the same time, we still have, I shouldn't say the FDA, the CMS. FDA has approved these things for usage. Now, we don't have an indication for them yet. There's still studies going on. So we don't really know if they're efficacious for certain things like back pain or disc pain or a disc herniation. Very good. Thank you for that. And then, you know, this this is a um, a good question because you know, oftentimes the spine is is such a, a large anatomical structure, uh, and um, which could take hours to go through each area. Uh, and still not be able to get enough information um, to answer all everyone's questions. But um, in general with the spine, I know there's there's a lot of emphasis occasionally when we talk about low back pain and such. But is it is it safe to say that we, in the, when we look at cervical pain and cervical related issues, um, treatment, the, the anatomy though looks a little different, but functions in a similar fashion. Are treatments similar, you know, muscular conditions, uh, working with physical therapy, uh, facet related issues, uh, disc related issues, things like that, whether it be in the back or whether it be in the neck, approaches are somewhat similar. Uh, Dr. Ajaboye, maybe. Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree. So um, I think the, the, the general treatment principles are pretty similar for both neck and back problems. Um, Back problems just happen to be a lot more common, right? Just, just the way we are as human beings and our anatomy uh, being, you know, vertical organisms. Uh, so our back tends to undergo a lot more stress than the neck, but the treatment principles are the same. So whether it's for neck or back pain, uh, you know, options for, you know, anti-inflammatories, physical therapy, acupuncture, chiropractors, and some of the injections that Dr. Ramchandani went over uh, to me, I apply the same principles. Um, when, when it comes to surgeries, there's some slight subtleties, depending on you know, how you're going from the front or the back, uh, but they're still pretty similar areas. Um, and yeah, so thank you. Great. And Dr. Ramchandani, if, if this, would, this is our last question, but uh, if you have a, a few words as well. Yeah, absolutely. We do most of the things in the back and the neck similarly, medial branch blocks, facet injections, spinal cord stimulators even, we can do all that stuff in the back or the neck. Now, there are certain things that we want to be a little bit more careful with with the neck than the back, like ablations and, and vertebral uh, uh, augmentation or kyphoplasty. But for the most part, we do everything in the neck and the back. Fantastic. And thank you very much. Thank you both very much for one, uh, being able to uh, offer uh, uh, your, your very valuable time to be able to, to come to this group today uh, to be able to present. And we want to thank to, thanks to all of the attendings uh, to this lecture. Uh, excellent questions for sure. A big thanks again to Dr. Ram Chandani and Dr. Ajaboye for taking the time to provide us with the valuable information that they've been able to. I'm sure that there are going to be more questions uh, and we encourage you to, to reach out uh, as you can uh, to help with uh, gaining more understanding and information. Uh, we'll be sending, we will be sending a recording of this presentation to all the attendees, uh, and it will be posted on our YouTube channel, which you can access by typing Providence into the search bar once you're in YouTube. Uh, and then as mentioned earlier, we do have 17 Providence hospitals throughout California as shown on the maps, uh, both in Southern California, as well as in Northern California. Um, to find a physician or to schedule an appointment, please call our Patient Engagement Center. Uh, and you may want to break out a pen or a pa pen and paper, but it's 1-888-278-3556. Again, 1-888-278-3556. If you're in the Southern Cal, that's now that's if you're in the Southern California area. But if you're in the Northern California area, you're going to call this number 1-833-339. 0646. And I'll repeat that one more time. 1 833 
You can also visit us at providence.org and click on the Find a Doctor tab in the navigation bar. And we look forward to being able to really be a part of your recovery and, and look forward to caring for you and your loved ones. And I want to thank everybody again and really wish you all a great rest of your evening. Thank you.